Liz and I served overseas with the International Mission Board for a uh, long time, nine years. We were with the International Mission Board, seven of those years outside the United States. Uh, whenever we went to our last assignment with the uh, all type people in southern Siberia, in the mountains, uh, we went there just kind of going, well, I have a border way. You know, we didn't have a place to stay, you know, exactly how we were going to reach them and all that. And so God just kind of opened up the doors and revealed as we went along. And I remember sitting down with some of the leaders and, uh, and saying, they're like, well, why are you here? So I, I said, well, let me show you. And I demonstrated. And afterwards, they're like, well, why are you really here? And I said, so I took a piece of paper and I took a pen and I drew a, a building that looked like an American church with a steeple and a cross on the top and all that. And I said, in the United States of America, this is how we express church. So I'm here to help you and the all time to learn how to express church. And I said, this is how we're going to do it. So I took the pen and a piece of paper and I would put the pen to the paper and then I would hand it to them. I said, I'm not here to tell you how to do church to express church. I'm here to teach you the difficult principles of what God says a church should do and how it should function, how a leader should lead, and how, how you do outreach and those things. And I said, but how do you express that? That's how God's going to lead you. And so in America, we have this paradigm that church, we have to have a building and pews in a row and a seminary trained uh, pastor and, and uh, we meet at a certain time on Sunday morning. That's, that's great works, right? But if we go outside that paradigm, sometimes people get nervous and they get, they're like, this is not really church. It doesn't feel like church. It's because we're getting used to it, right? And the way we do it, we have a great thing going. God is good to us. Amen? Amen. So we've been kind of going over some things about the church, what the Bible says, uh, how it's uh, the foundation of the Old, Old Testament, how Jesus came and how he told Peter, you know, upon your profession, well, upon this profession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. On that, I will build my church. And that's what Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. You don't remember that. And so all of those things that we've been learning for the last few weeks, I want to put together and I want to call it rebuilding the church or building the church or renewing the church, how you want to this this PowerPoint says rebuilding. So when you read, when you build something, let's think about building. Well, let's talk about this building. This foundation has actual rocks as the foundation, not concrete blocks. In some places there's concrete blocks, but uh, you've ever seen an old house that you just go out and fill and grab rocks and start piling them up, right? Well, we are going to look at the foundation for the church from what we've already looked at. And uh, what, give me the next slide there. Remember we looked at Psalm 118, the, the hymn that Jesus sang probably at the end of the uh, uh, Lord's Supper? One of those uh, verses there, verse 22, says, The self that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. Let's show the next one. This is not the only place. In Isaiah, it says, Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be forsaken, or never be shaken. The next one, from Acts, we got, you know, it also says that in the Gospels, uh, the Gospels has this same uh, verse many times. But in Acts, when uh, they were preaching and teaching about the new church, they said this, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone we pray for you father god as we come into your presence as we open up your word and begin to take the things that we've learned over the past few weeks and put it together in a way that is just uh easy to understand easy to apply father i just pray your holy spirit is all over 
that you're opening our understanding, that you're opening, giving us ideas of application, and that, Father, it's all about what Jesus has done. It's not what we're doing. We build on that. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, the stone, Jesus, the testimony that, that Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus came for a purpose. He came to save sinful men from their sin, to restore the brokenness between man and God. And that's why he came. That's what we're building on. We're not building on some Old Testament temple of dead lambs and bulls. We're building on the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. It is his body. And on that, so the next slide is our foundation, one more, is Jesus. Our foundation is Jesus. But, you know, when you build a house, you may have a cheap cornerstone, but you can't have a house sitting on just one stone. So let's look at the next slide. We need stones. It says we need more than one, right? First Peter 2, 4 through 6 says, um, you're coming to Christ. Let me get over there. I'm behind. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, it says, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. How do we build on the foundation of Jesus? We believe in him. We trust him. We put our faith in him. And it, the Bible tells us that we become children of God, that we become, you can sum in one sentence, like Jesus. Uh, we, then we work and live and learn to be Christ-like throughout our lives. And we become those stones that God uses to build his house. Mm -hmm. And so let's uh, go on to the next one. In 1 Corinthians, we look at this verse too. It says, all of you together are Christ's body. And each of, you, each of you is a part of it. And here are some of the parts that God has appointed for the church. First, our apostles, second prophets, third are teachers, and then those who do miracles, and those who have gifts of healing, those who can help others, those who, those who have gifts of leadership, and those who speak in unknown tongues. These are is what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. This is beginning to put those stones in place to begin to build his church. That he not only has saved us for a purpose, remember like I said, we were citizens of the world and we were part of the family of the devil before we were saved. Now you may not like that, but that's what Jesus said, okay? His words are your children of the devil. It's because of sin. And then when we are saved, we become strangers in this world. We're no longer part of the world. The church is a place for us to come together. Yeah, it's a place for us to be a part and not only are we here in the part that Jesus wants us to excel and he gives us spiritual gifts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. To build his church. So the next one, one more. So the stones, there's Jesus, of course. Now, I think there's some churches out there, I may be correct, that there's some churches out there that are trying to build on something other than Jesus. You, have you heard of any of those? Me. Okay, I have to. So, I mean, I don't want to, like, I want to be careful, okay, what I'm saying about that, because, you know, even uh, the broke clock is right twice a day, right? Uh, there are people in some of these cults and some of these places that uh, are truly believing in Jesus, but they're really misguided by what they're around and surrounded and here. Mm -hmm. But I can't say that if any church is not built on the good news of Jesus Christ, him crucified and raised from the dead, then it is not God's church. Yeah. And if the church is made up of people who were not redeemed by the blood of Jesus and who have been transformed by the gospel, 
than the church. It's not the church that God intends. So this, the foundation has, has been laid, not by us, but by God. And then we become part of that. So the next one, you know whenever we build uh, most structures, unless it's kind of abstract, we have an east wall, an east, oh, an east south, south, south wall, south. north wall, north wall, this wall, and that wall. <laughs> My family is the greatest in the town. It doesn't matter. This wall, that wall, you know, you got it. Alright, there's four walls. And so what, as I pray through this, and I'm not the only one who's, who's done this, and all of those functions of church that we have talked about over the years, what we have talked about, or, you know, and especially lately in Acts chapter 2, we talked about the leadership, the preaching, the teaching. We talked about the ordinances, the baptism, and uh, the Lord's Supper. We talked about the giving, the prayer, the fellowship. We talked about the ministry. We talked about the mission. All of those functions of the church, I want to just kind of encapsulate those or put them in four groups. Number one is gathering together. If you go to the next verse, of course, this is very familiar to us. It says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of Jesus' returning is drawing near. That was written about 2,000 years ago. Imagine, they thought the day of Jesus was drawing near. How much closer is it today? How much more do we need to encourage each other? How much more do we need to gather together? First Corinthians 14, 26 says this. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, it doesn't say if you meet together, it doesn't. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues while another will interpret what he said. But everything that is done will strengthen all of you. So, I know it's, we've talked a lot about what Scripture says there about speaking in tongues. That's something we don't practice because we don't practice it. There's other churches that do. Okay, I'll just leave it at that and we'll move on. Uh, I speak in hillbilly and you should still hear me. <laughs> So let's talk about wall one. All these stones come together. They have to have a foundation. You have to have these stones together. So the next part says gathering together, call it corporate worship. Or we can say we're reaching up. We're, we're reaching up and we're praising the Lord for what He's done. And as we do that, we praise God, we share with others what we believe about God, right? So how do we do that? So in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, it says they met in the temple regularly, but they met in homes daily. So the example from Scripture is large group gatherings and small group gatherings. So how do we express that? We express that with Sunday morning worship service. And, we, and some churches have Sunday night worship services, and Wednesday night worship services, and Saturday night worship services. And Friday night youth service. I mean, some churches are worshiping all the time, right? Uh, we, because to get you guys to drive uh, an hour and a half to two hours twice on Sunday, that's, that's just unrealistic. Because some of you drive a little ways away, some of you don't. But still, there's opportunities for small group. And how do we do that? We do Sunday school, we do uh, on Sunday morning, D Live groups, we do uh, Wednesday night. Uh, prayer right now. Hopefully it'll grow and we'll get back to Bible study on Wednesday night. That's a prayer. We do meet on Wednesday night, 6 30. And we meet live on that in the annex and on Zoom. We can't make it live. So we're building on the foundation. So we build uh we got Jesus and the first wall is we gather. We gather together. We gather and then the next one let's go on over is teaching and training. Grow, grow in the Lord. Acts chapter 2 says this, all the believers devote themselves to what? The apostles' teaching and to fellowship, sharing meals, including the Lord's supper and prayer. 
In Ephesians 4, which we've looked at, says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, teacher. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work, build up the church, the body of Christ. So when do we do the equipping? When do we do the uh, following the teachings of the, the leaders? Like Matthew 28, 20 in the Great Commission says, teach the new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. When we come together, when we gather together, we gather to teach. The, uh, one of the uh, teachings of Paul says, to teach one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Do you know that the songs that we sing and the hymns that we sing and the praise music that we sing is part of growing you in Christ's likeness, to an understanding of who God is and what He expects. So all two, teach and train. Teach and train equals equipping. And we reach people by teaching them. Through Sunday school, Bible studies, deep groups, we do We've been to conferences, and we've done training events, right? We've uh, done a little bit of that, we need to do more. So the second wall, let's go all the way through those. We build on Jesus, the church, we gather, we gather, the second wall is grow. We get to, we, grow, we come together for the purpose of growing. Wall three, Isaiah. When Jesus was walking he, uh, on the earth, he went to the synagogue, he opened up the scrolls and he began to read this passage after he read it and he said, this is fulfilled in your hearing he, and then later on he said, greater works than I do will you do so what the works that Jesus did he commissioned us to continue to do that work, so here's what Jesus read, he said he has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed he has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of God's favor has come, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give them a crown of uh, beauty of ashes. Excuse me. He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing the cities destroyed long ago. Part of what God has called us to do is to minister to others, meeting needs. Meeting needs equals ministry, serving others. Uh, when this church merged with Stottsville, Baptist, it became the, the uh, motto or the saying, Love God, love others, serve the world. Serving means ministry, doing ministry. We reach in. We start in the body of Christ. We minister to one another when we come together. How do we do that? We pray for the needs of people, and we pray with people. You ever had somebody come to you and says, hey, I want to ask you to pray for me. You say, I'll do that, and you walk off. <clears throat> you know what I started doing? I'm just like, I want to forget. Can I just pray with you right now? Just pray with them on the spot. Right on the spot. I will tell you that encourages people. Mm -hmm. when, you, when they ask you to pray, you pray. They, they, that's encouraging. It's encouraging to me. <clears throat> we encourage one when we come together. Now, I'll, I'll say this. I know it's been recorded. I'm sorry for, for my friends in Russia to hear this. But when you go up and ask the Russian man, oh, my dog's died. I have no money. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is not encouraging when you meet Greek and Russian people. I don't know if that's part of their culture or what. It's, it's just it's depressing. That's not the way it should be when believers come together. When you come together, it's like, how you doing, brother? I am blessed. God is so good. Now, I may have cancer and, uh, you know, I have uh, my brain taken out, but I'm still blessed. I'm here. I mean, we've got to encourage one another. Also, you know why? It's discouraging when you go out those doors sometimes. Amen. Yeah. We have to be different than the world because we are different. Mm -hmm. Counseling one another. Counseling scares people sometimes. 
how do you counsel somebody when they say, you know, I, I, I got this issue and I don't, I don't know what to do? You say, you need to know more of God. And you need to say, you know, I found some encouraging words in Scripture. Let me share that with you. And if you are really in need of counsel individually, I just recommend reading the Psalms. Because David dealt with a lot of issues. And, uh, and in the end, you want to praise God. When we meet together, our third wall, and not only do we give to others by fellowshipping and by encouraging and praying for them, we give financially to the needs of the church. Why? Because God told us to, to give 10%. That's not an option for a Christian. He said, well, I don't believe that, Pastor. Well, you don't have to believe it, just that you have to answer Jesus for that, not me. Because I don't keep tithe workers. Okay? I don't. I, I take care of what happens after it gets away. Right? We pay the bills, lights, and stuff like that. Uh, Steve does too. <laughs> um, offerings. Offering is above the time. And then whenever. Sometimes sacrificial giving. Sometimes, sometimes somebody has a need. They have a death in the family. They don't have any means. So we try to help them. Uh, somebody has just uh, overload and they need a touch and they help from us. Uh, who's supposed to do that? Government? No. no you are. <laughs> as as the family of God, we are to take care of the family of God. Mercy. We've had a lot of deaths in our church family in the last two years. And uh, I'm telling you, one of the ways to reach need it's by being there praying for it and just sometimes you don't have to say a word you just say i'm here whatever you need i'm here you know uh you guys are great about providing food but we need to be there when people need visit for the need encouragement so let's look at what we built so far we got Jesus the foundation, we are the stones, we gather together, we grow together, and we give together. We give, minister, fellowship with one another. Why? Because that was the example that was given to us in Acts chapter 2. It's the example given to us of Jesus. And as we move on to wall 4, this is not one of those dreaming houses that only has three walls and this one looks out on the bay. Okay? It's, <laughs> we have to have a fourth wall. Right? And without the fourth wall, we will cease to be the church. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah, I skipped part of the first part of Isaiah 61, and now I'm going to go back and read it. Jesus, when uh, he was talking to the Jews, read this, and he said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That was talking about Jesus. And then Jesus turns around in Matthew 28 and says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And then in Acts 1.8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I've heard people say, Well, Isaiah 61, that was talking about Jesus, not me. <laughs> well, you got to go to Matthew 28.19. And they said, well, that was Jesus talking to the disciples. He wasn't talking to me. Well, I'm going to tell you, the disciples, the apostles are dead. Who's going to do it if it's not us? It is the church's responsibility. Individual members of the church that call that body of believers to go and tell the good news. Everyone. Not just the evangelists, not just the preachers and deacons and elders and Sunday school teachers. It's every living person who's got breath can say tell somebody about Jesus all four sharing Jesus is equal to missions missions comes out as reaching out beyond the walls of the church Simple. and how do we do that you start with your circles of influence talk about this that the word oikos in the book of Acts is used many times in Greek and it's translated household. Household kind of puts it within the walls of your home, right? But it, that's, it's, it's a good translation, but there's more to it. We understand it to mean relationships. 
relationships with people who lives in your home, the people that your your immediate family, your extended family, your some of your closer to your friends than you are to your family, right? And you do that on purpose. Uh, some of you have co-workers and you have neighbors, you have acquaintances, and didn't always like to put this at the end. The person next that God brings into your life. It's people you haven't met yet, but one day you will. And they become part of your circle of influence. And we pray for those people. And some of the church terms that we use is evangelism, outreach, visitation, uh, invitation, and missions. These are words that we use in church, but it's all ways of formalizing sharing the good news of Jesus. There was a few years ago, a guy named Robinson uh, came out with a book called, uh, I think it's called Sharing Jesus Without Fear. And he was, he wasn't against what we call cold call evangelism. Now, cold call evangelism is where you go in the neighborhood and you just go knock on the door and you say, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? And you come to the place in your life where you uh, know for certain that you have eternal life and that um, you yes or no, most people say, well, I don't think I'm going to go to heaven. He said, if you're standing for Jesus, and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? So most people would go, well, I went to church a couple times. That's good. Uh, my grandmother was Catholic, or something like that. You know, they have something. So right away, you know, well, this is a conversation that needs to go on, because we've got to get to Jesus. And somebody asking you him for forgiveness and being Savior. So when you get into those conversations, Knocking on those doors. I've done that. That is some of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. Okay? I've talked to the KGB right this week, and that wasn't the scariest knocking on doors sometimes, knocking on what's on the other side, where you smell the burning rope coming through the window. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like the back water. You know, you have nervous. Am I going to even have a chance to talk somewhere and going to shoot through the door? I don't know. That's cold call evangelism. What he's talking about, Robinson was writing a book, it's like, you know, most of us don't do cold call evangelism, we do relational evangelism. Yeah. And when you do relational evangelism, you're building a relationship, a genuine relationship that leads to a spiritual conversation, that leads to a gospel conversation. There's a difference between a spiritual conversation and a gospel conversation. Spiritual conversation may be something like this. Hey, I see you're wearing a cross. Do you go to church somewhere? Oh, no, that's, uh, I got that when I bought those Christian Dior jeans, right? You know, something like that. That's the way to tell me. Well, for me, that cross represents what Jesus did for me. Amen. So, I mean, that spiritual conversation led to a gospel conversation. Yeah. Uh, so, we, as the church, one of the walls has doors, like that, on the east west side. side. East, east side. side. East side. Yeah. All right, that's okay. I know where the door is. I don't know where I'm going, but I know where you are. East side. We yes. anyway, when we go out that door, we go on a mission. And the mission is not complete when we come in the door. We get mission assignments. We get mission equipped. We get things what we need to be able to go out the door to complete the mission. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. It's, it's, yeah. Okay. Anybody nervous? Should be nervous. And so let's see what we build. We got Jesus the foundation. We are the spiritual stones that, that, that God uses to gather, to grow, to give. To go. Boy, they all start with G. They can be easy to remember. You got to release the first letter of every one. Let's put it in a different format. The next one. Wall one, gathering together. Wall two, teaching and training one another. Wall three, meeting needs. And four, sharing Jesus. Gather, grow, give, and go. This is it. This is what God's called us to do. Now let's apply this. So just we do this as a corporate body, but what do some of these small groups? The, the International Mission Board began to use the term affinity. I was like, well, that's a good word. I look it up, so I, I know what it meant, what they're talking about. Basically, it means people groups or people who have a common interest. 
So when we talk about doing church, and we, we do the gather, grow, give, and go thing, we understand that as a corporate body. But what about a youth Sunday school class? A youth Sunday school class, or a children's class, or a woman's women's class, or a men's class? The youth group, the youth class, should have four walls of gathering, growing, giving, and going. This youth Sunday school class should have a ministry project. It should have a, a, a missional element to it. Shannon does a great job. Thank you, Shannon, for that. Your children's class should have those things. Now, taking your children out and they can do a cold call dance with them, I don't remember. Okay? But they can talk to their parents and their other siblings. You can begin to plant the seeds of how to share their testimony of the gospel with the children's class. The women's class. The women's class, the same thing. Men's class. Men like to do ministry a lot of times. You give them a project and say, hey guys, we're going to meet, we're going to have food, we're going to do something, and do ministry. They're like, we're going to have food? Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> right, guys? Come on, be yes. honest. Right? If you're going to have a ministry uh, with men involved, you've got to have food. I just promise you, you won't have it. It's experience. But what about other affinity groups that we can have? What about a seniors group? What about people who meet in homes in a certain neighborhood? Right? Uh, yeah, we won't do those. Just leave it up right there. We can create different affinities, small groups, with like, we've been praying for several years about the Homestead neighborhood uh, there in Monrovia. Mm -hmm. I drive through there often and just pray for the houses. I got lost once. But I, you know, fortunately, there's only two ways in and out, but I think so. I told you I'm challenged. Directly challenged. So, youth group. Men's group, wall one, gather the men together, grow the men, go up to the third. Men should be ministering to one another, encouraging one another. Uh, some Sundays, when Daryl is here, uh, I guarantee you, Daryl's here, he's put the basket in front of your notes when we put a dollar in there. Y'all remember that? Yeah. And all that money went. So thank God for that because we are now dead free. And part of that is because we gave. Dollar every Sunday, right? Dollar does it. Growing, going. Even in our worship, we know the main part of large group is worshiping Jesus. That is our big emphasis. It's preaching and, and worshiping. But in your Sunday school, you have to look at your Sunday school class as a way of worshiping Jesus. But you're emphasizing the growing part, the teaching in the Sunday school. Now, you can also bring your uh, guitar if you want, Nikki, next week, and you can sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, what does the church look like? Well, if you were in Africa with a, with a hut uh, and a log as your instrument, would you be worshiping God in this format? The guy gets up and you're all sitting around... Uh, Indian style, which I cannot do anymore. I would be reclining, I guess. Would that be fulfilling the growing part? If afterwards you all got together and you were sharing uh, banana leaves and rice and different things like that, and you encouraged one to create together, if you don't have uh, pews and a basket to pass or a box to pass, you don't have all that, can you still have church? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, what if you were, like, we, we went to church in Thailand one time, and it looked like a picnic shelter. There was no walls. We, we all sat at, like, picnic tables, and the guy who got up and, and preached just kind of stood in front, and this was with the uh, Karen people, right? I think it was Karen uh, from uh, Bur Burma, and they were refugees in there. We, we worshiped them. And it was amazing. We worshiped with Russians uh, around a picnic table with a million mosquitoes. And, uh, um, it was, did, we, did, did we have church? Because we had someone who was proclaiming the word. We sang together. We worshiped God together. We ministered to one another. We had fellowship together. And they had people there who had never been there before. So when we think about church, we think about larger, 
we think about smaller. I want you to think about we do it on purpose for, to worship Jesus. It, it's not about becoming a, a, a club, exclusive membership at Crosswell. No way. It should never be that. It should be so simple that you should be able to go out here tomorrow and say, well, how do, how, how do you guys do church? church? Well, we gather, we grow, we give, and we go. You can write it down. I'll give you a handout if you want. I love handouts. We'll be a test, fill in the blanks, right? We'll do that. But I want it to be so simple that it, it, it doesn't take a seminary education to understand it. Uh, the, the early church didn't have that. If the early church could understand it through the power of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of Jesus Christ, anybody can understand how simple church needs to be. That programs, that any program that we have should fall under one of these categories. It should be to grow the church. It should be a ministry of the church. It should be an outreach of the church. Or it should be something that helps the church worship better. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. But it, it's useless without Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to give an invitation. I'm going to ask the Christ to come. And so we need to emphasize more and more our importance and dependency on Jesus. On what He has done for us, what He's doing for us, and what He will do for us. You know, some people say, we're just one generation from the church ceasing to exist. That will never happen. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the church is not ours. It is God's church. And God said there will always be a remnant. There will always be a church that exists when Jesus comes. So, does that give us an excuse not to do anything? No, it gives us the motivation to be more of what God would have us to be. But it starts with faith in Jesus. It's amazing that people think by coming to church that they can win favor with God. They think, some people think by, well, if I just give money to the church and I do something at church that God will be pleased with me and he will let me in heaven. No, he won't. Heaven, going to heaven, is based on what Jesus did. Amen. Not on what you do. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we accept the work of Christ by faith. And God says, now you're my child. And the benefit is heaven. Amen. Amen. Eternal life. How many times as the church do we forget that the Christian life is dependent also on what Jesus did? That what we do as a church is because Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit to come and to help us. He's given us natural abilities, but he's also gifted us to be the church. So we need to be reminded of that. Will you stand with me as we have prayer time? Father God, I think about the Psalm 118 that was written over 2,000 years ago, maybe 3,000 years ago. And in that, you knew that Jesus would be the cornerstone of why we're here today. I think about the book of Isaiah written 28, 2,700 years ago. You prophesied the ministry and the work of Jesus. And not only Jesus, but that Jesus would tell us to do the very same things. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus walked on the earth, he commissioned not only the disciples and the apostles of that day, but he commissioned us to go, to tell, to teach, to gather. Lord, help us to be mindful of your activity through history up until this point. And that what you said then still applies today. That we are your children for a purpose. Help us to live in that purpose. Father, we just pray these things. Give this invitation to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come to Jesus.